Isn't God good? Amen. Amen. Let's clap like we really mean it. Amazing that when we go through struggles and things, it's in a great to not only have God, but to have each other. Amen. Uh, it's great to have a church family and uh, support. Man, we need each other. Amen? Amen. Because we just battle stuff all the time. There's always seems to be a battle in life. Amen? Amen? And you think about it, war is a fact of life. You know, even our young country uh, has been involved in many wars, whether it's the Revolutionary War. Whether it's uh, Civil War, whether it's World War I and II, uh, Korean War, Vietnam, Iraq, I mean, it's just kind of a, a way of life. And, and, and conflict has been going on ever since man's been walking on this earth. But there's another battle that has been waging against us in the spiritual realm, the unseen, the invisible realm. Uh, that we don't think too much about. And I hope today that changes a little bit. Because I want us to be mindful of that. Uh, that there is another battle uh, in the spirit realm. As the adversary of our soul is warring against us every single day. Do you know that? I mean, stop and think. Because if it's not something I can see, touch, smell, feel, hear, it's not real. And we forget about that there's a spirit realm that is working and warring against each other all the time and against the church. But we don't think about that. I want us to look at a scripture that is in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. And look at this. It says, a final word. This is from Paul. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all, not some, but all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. All the strategies of the devil. You know, when I was looking at that verse, my, a word popped out. Strategies. <laughs> the devil has strategies. He's not just someone that just kind of randomly runs around and looks for, you know, if he sees an opportunity, he might pounce on it or do something. He's, he's strategic in that he's working against us in the kingdom of God strategically. That, that he's trying to do everything he can to fulfill his job description. And John 10, 10 tells us what that is. That he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his purpose. That's all he thinks about. He's consumed with stealing and killing and destroying. And so he does it through strategy. That some things that are happening, it was planned out by him. I think... Today, in the 21st century, that Christians have forgotten that there's this dark realm, this dark spiritual realm that wars against our soul every single day. I, th I think we have forgotten that. And, and one of the things that uh, made me think that is when my sister-in-law, she was doing an ancestry study, you know, it's one of those family tree things, you know. And so she went way back, way hundreds of years and hundreds of and so my brother told me, he goes, hey, hey, King, you know that there, there was a, a minister uh, in our, our family line? And I said, really? And I said, well, gosh, over a few hundred years, I'm sure there were several. So he said, yeah, but this guy was peculiar. <laughs> and I go, really? And so I, I, I look at it, and he, I go, what, what was his name? Cotton Mather. Really? So I did some research on it, and this guy was leading the charge back in the 1600s that you might have heard of in regards to the, the Salem witch trials. Now, he was, that's Cotton Mathers. And, and he was the one that was uh, leading the charge in this. This whole commotion going on in these, uh, the Salem witch uh, uh, trials. And so, and I'm reading this and how they were trying to convict these witches and then some of them were getting off and then so they changed the law so they can, because it's just kind of hard to prove the spiritual, you know. And so, but anyways, it became this huge issue. And so when I was studying that and looking at that, something jumped out at me. I'm thinking, you know what? It was amazing. Back in their day, it was, the spirit realm was so real that, oh, you're a witch, you're practicing witchcraft, you're uh, a Satanist or, you know, a psychic and all that. They 
were coming after you. The church was going up again because there was such a sensitivity and awareness of the spirit realm. I'm thinking today, if someone said they're witchcraft, we're like, whatever. Really? You can go to San Francisco to a satanic church. It's, look, I, I couldn't even imagine turning the TV on and seeing this broadcast and this coverage of a court that is trying people uh, as being witches. And we're all talking about it. Because we don't even, we don't even think about it. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? We've forgotten darkness. We have forgotten about the fact that there is a, 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 say, a, a Satan that roams around like a roaring lion looking to whom he may devour, the Bible says. That there is spiritual warfare taking place all the time. And I think we have forgotten about darkness in these last days in which we need to know and think and consider more than any other time. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that, Lord, your word would open our hearts and our lives, that, Lord, that we would be receptive to what it is that you speak to us today. And, Lord, may your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. So, with that in mind, I want to give you four basic truths about spiritual warfare. Now, you might not have been uh, taught on this a whole lot, so I hope I can show you some things about the spirit realm and, and, and spiritual warfare, which is vital to the believer that you need to know and to have. But I'm going to give you the basic fundamentals. Uh, each point I could probably just do a whole sermon on, but let's look at this because I think it's really interesting. And so the first uh, basic truth I want you to think about, there's a, an invisible world. There is an invisible world that is just as real as the physical world that you live in. I think believers tend to accept the reality only uh, those things that we can see, taste, smell, hear, feel. But you know what? The Bible sitting on my desk is just as real. That the, the shirt on my back is real. The, the, the roast in the oven is real because we can experience those things and see those things and, and smell those things. And therefore, it's real because by my senses, I determine that. Now, think about this. And because I don't see it and I'm not smelling it and I can't feel it, touch it, or anything. Somehow, that level of reality is a little lesser. And it's not. The spirit realm is just as real as the physical realm. I want you to really get that in your head. It's just as real. I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Look what it says here. Now, let's all read this together. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rules and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world. Now, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Now, Paul wrote that. How many would agree with me that the Bible is truth? That passage that you just read is truth. That is real, but we don't think about it. But there is really, uh, in the unseen world, evil rulers and demons and spirits that are warring against the church, warring against the kingdom of God every single day. But we just don't realize that. You know, I, when I was a young Christian, as a teenager, you know, I accept uh, the Lord, we would go to church, and, and so you just try to do your best and live in the, according to the word, and you just believe in Jesus, and everything's pretty good, but I, you know, never really thought about the spirit realm. Until one time, there was this man in our church named Harvey, and he really had some issues, and you know, every church has one. And so I'm, I'm not sure which one it is in here. But <laughs> it's the person you're like, he's, he's got to be demon possessed, right? And so, but he had some serious issues. And well, one night we're at home and watching TV. And I'm, I think I was in my bedroom upstairs and the doorbell rings. And so I go downstairs and one night, I open the door and there's Harvey standing at her door. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and so I, he comes in, I go get my mom. And she says, I go, hey, Harvey's down there. He goes, Harvey's here. I go, yeah. And I, and I, so I go back upstairs. She's down there. And all of a sudden, we hear her yelling. Okay? And so what had happened was, when she's down there, he's like, you know, so he's talking to my mom. He's like, man, I just got these issues, man. I'm just this stuck in my head. And I, I, I don't know what to do. And I feel things that I don't know why. And, and I'm battling things. And, and just really crazy stuff, right? And she's like, well, let's call Pastor Lamb. 
And, and Pastor Lamb was really uh, gifted in uh, casting out demons and, and dealing with the, uh, the spirit realm. And so uh, she calls him, so he comes and so they're talking and, and she goes, she calls Pastor Lamb and says, hey, you know, Harv's here and yada, 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 you know, can you talk and pray with him? He just really needs prayer right now. So she hands him the phone and so he's praying over and all of a sudden she's just sitting there kind of on the couch too, just praying, at, at, you know, not knowing what Pastor Lamb's praying, but they're just praying and all of a sudden she sl he slams the phone down on the receivers. Boom! My mom jumps and looks. And for you young people, their phones used to, <laughs> they, like there's a box that had a dial on it, and you could slam down on the receiver. And so, I know something like, what do you mean you slam this phone down on the receiver? Uh, you just turn it off. And so, no, so that's what happened. So they slammed it down on the receiver, and so she looks up, and she, he says, I hate you. And he gets up and starts to move towards her. And she's freaking out. And that's when she started yelling. So we run down there. And so uh, we're like talking. And, and my stepdad gets in between them. And, and saying, oh, Harvey, you need to sit down. You just need to chill. And he's just like freaking. And so, true story, folks. And so I know you have a hard time believing this because we don't think about the spirit realm. Neither did I. But I was scared that night. And so Pastor Lamb comes over. And so they're talking. And, and, and he starts casting out these demons, right? And I'm like, this is crazy. I'm going, I, so I left. I'm upstairs, right? <laughs> so I'm upstairs in my room, and I'm like, man, this, I don't know what to do. And this is crazy. And they're thinking, if you cast the demons, what if they come up like through the, through, I mean, like in the movies, you seem like to fly off somewhere, you know? They're going to come up in my bedroom. So I go back downstairs. So, you know, while they're coming up, I went down the stairs, trying to out with them a little bit. And so I'm standing there, and so I get behind the couch, right? And so I'm standing there, my mom comes around me, and they're doing their thing, and and, and he's sitting there, and the pastor has his arm around him, and, and they're praying, and okay, everything's going to be okay. And he just like, it's almost like, you know, exorcist type thing, you know. I, 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 I was waiting for the green stuff to come out, but it never happened. But he turned and looked at my mom. It's like it just turned his head, and he says, I'm going to get you. And I'm just freaking out. And so they go through this whole thing in prayer, and finally uh, he leaves. And uh, as he leaves, he's saying, how many of you believe that the devil's a liar? He's leaving, and he says, well, there's demons in. My mom had this, like, a little, like, suit of armor, like, thing by the fireplace. And the demons are in there and all this, and so they're leaving. And now you're thinking they're in, they're everywhere, right? You know how you can get those bugs crawl on you, and you think they're everywhere? That's what I was feeling. The demons are everywhere now in our house. And so, but the thing, the whole point is this. That experience brought me to a place where there I realized that I know that I know without a shadow of a doubt there is a spirit realm. Jesus, we read in the Gospels all the time, Jesus was casting out demons and all that stuff, and it was like, oh, that was 2,000 years ago. I, I, the demons are all dead, right? <laughs> they, they don't die. So what happened in the Bible still happens today. They're still here today. Demons don't die. And so if we believe in the Bible, and we do, then we have to believe that the satanic realm is still alive and active. Amen. So the first thing you've got to understand, church, is this. There is an invisible world that's just as real as this one, just as real as this pulpit. And it is moving and acting every day. Now, the second truth I want you to think about is we are involved in an invisible war. Where do we usually encounter spiritual warfare? I want to, uh, three areas, and I'm going to tell you why it's in those three areas. But the first one is in prayer. We always say this, prayer warriors. Why? Because we go to battle. We stand in the gap. We're fighting in, in, in prayer. There's power in prayer. Now, in the Bible, there was a story where Daniel was praying, and his prayer wasn't answered, or it wasn't being answered, at least at the time. Have you ever been there? Have you ever prayed and you didn't get an answer? Okay, that's spiritual because you're just like Daniel now. And so we all battle that. But here's the deal. And this scripture opened the door for me to see that sometimes when we're praying, man, there's, whenever you pray, there's spiritual, I mean, there's, a, there's warfare going on. Now, Daniel hadn't received his, his answer, but an angel visited him and explained why. And I hope this explains some things to you that you'd understand something. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, it says this. Then he said, Daniel, or excuse me, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. 
Then Michael, and I was referring to the archangel, Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia, and then he was able to come to assist Daniel. But when you look at that scripture, it's interesting that for three weeks, this angel who's bringing the message, the answer to the prayer, was resisted. And, and he, he came across opposition from, uh, obviously, the, the realm of darkness and the kingdom of darkness. And so that uh, spirit prince of the kingdom of uh, Persia blocked him. So there was spiritual warfare going on. And I wonder how sometimes when we're praying, we're not getting the answer, if there's something blocking it, if there's spiritual warfare that is taking place in, 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 in our prayer lives. And I think that in three weeks, most of us would be discouraged. And I think the devil knows that. He knows time is our, uh, sometimes for some of us our worst enemy. And if he can go two days, three days a week, a month, you're going to quit. You're going to give up. Give up what? The fight. Prayer is fighting. Prayer is fighting. We think it's some kind of like a formula. If I just say, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And on we say these prayers and then it's, everything works. It's like hocus pocus. And it's not that. Prayer is fighting and wrestling and, 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 and the spiritual enemies that war against us each and every day. And so I want us to think about that. That when we, we understand that we are in a spiritual warfare, a battle. And prayer is vital, part of that. And when we seek God and pray. Uh, I know the whole message is just on prayer. The other thing is faith. Faith is vital uh, because, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. And some of you, but look what it says here in this translation, in Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Now, Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter in the Bible. You read that's just all about by faith they did this, by faith they did that. It's just an uh, incredible display of the uh, great exploits that were accomplished through faith. Now, in verse 1 and 2, it says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earn a good reputation. Now, faith is a, an incredible uh, weapon. Faith enables us to stand firm. Faith enables us to trust God. Faith enables us to believe when it's unbelievable. And we need that in spiritual warfare. I, I like that. Now, if you read in Hebrews 11, you're going to see uh, all these great exploits that were accomplished through faith. I'm going to read a few of them. They're not on your outline, but just listen to this. It says, It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. It was by faith that Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were walking on dry land. Faith is so necessary in our spiritual journey, in our spiritual walk, so that we understand. Because if you are faithless... <coughs> Man, you are primed to quit. Faith is the, the very thing that we need the most that enables us to stand. And I'm not leaving. I'm not shaking. I'm going to continue because my God is bigger than my problems. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is uh, in comparison to my problems. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible. For he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is El Shaddai, the Almighty God. He is the Lion of Judah, the Prince of Peace. He is our God, and he is the one that fights our battles for us. What did Daniel or David say against Goliath? Look, Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and all that stuff. I come against you in the name of the Lord. It was the God's battle, and we faith enables us to let God fight for us. And David had incredible faith, and he says, David... Or Goliath, understand this. I fight you in the name of the Lord. And God guided that rock. God, faith enables God to be the one in charge in our battles. When we lack faith, we say, okay, how am I going to fix this? And we try to do all the work. We try to fix the problems. How many agree? We make a mess of things. When God's like, you know what? If you would have just done it this way, it would have been a lot easier. Now, there's something about faith that 
When you look at the greatest obstacle in your marriage, in your finances, in your physical health, whatever it is, that is so huge to where you just want to just cower down and say it's hopeless and you turn and walk away because without faith, you quit. Now, faith allows you to see things through the eyes of God. Yeah, I see that problem, but with God, when I look at it through the eyes of God, it's so small. And here's the deal. Well, you know what? I just have trouble with faith. Look, it doesn't take much. If you just have a, a little faith, you can move mountains, Amen. the Bible says. You don't need a whole lot. But I want us to look at a, a battle. Talk about a battle. Let's take it to a physical realm here for a second. Elisha was about to be, uh, King Ahab was going to attack. He literally had the entire city surrounded with his uh, soldiers, uh, chariots, and uh, were going to attack. Elisha's servant was scared. He's looking at the problem like we do in the physical realm. He's looking at this massive problem. Elisha, what are we going to do? Look at his response in 2 Kings chapter 6. Oh, my Lord, listen to these words. What will we do now? Have you ever said that? What am I going to do now? He cried out to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened his eyes. What eyes? So he could see the spirit realm, the invisible. He said, open his eyes. And when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Man, God revealed to them that he was already there, ready to go to battle. But lack of faith keeps them at bay. That, that's useless. But like Elisha, he had faith. He says, look, there's way more than us. Listen to this. I want you to get this truth. Elisha says to a servant, there's way more of us than there is of them. That was faith. Because look, God is always the majority. God on your side. And when, so when you realize that you're, whatever it is you're facing, you always have more. Because God's greater than your problems. He's the greater, your problems are the lesser. Amen? Amen. And it's always that way. But we don't think that or believe that when we walk in unbelief. Elijah said, no, we got this. David against Goliath, I got this. Because in the name of the Lord, this is going to be done. This is God's battle. And so I love that scripture because it allows us to see the physical realm, because the servant saw the chariots from King Ahab, that was real. Because he was focusing and, and operating by his senses. And, and he saw that, he could just envision them attacking, that was real. Elijah said, no, let me show you on the spirit realm that God's going to help us in this situ situation in the physical realm. Get it? I'm telling you, awesome stuff. The third thing is the word of God. You know, Satan will always try to fool you, mislead you, and guide you. He's a liar. Satan is a liar. And he's always going to try to deceive you. He lied to Eve in the garden. He says, look, God's not going to kill you. Eat the apple. Seriously, did God really say he's going to kill you and that you would die if you eat the apple? She, Satan manipulated him. And, so the, and he tries to do that with us with the word of God. No, it's not the word of God. That, 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 that doesn't make any sense. Jesus, after he was baptized, goes into the wilderness. 40 days to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted the whole entire time. Well, obviously, he was hungry. And so the devil pops up one day and says, Hey, Jesus, I bet you're pretty hungry. Why don't you turn those stones into loaves of bread and eat if you're the Son of God? And Jesus turned to him in Matthew 4 40 said this. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone but by the very word that comes from the mouth of God. And so Jesus, in that hour of temptation, I'm sure he was physically hungry and wanted to give in to that temptation, but spiritually, he stayed strong. He said, no, I live by the word of God. Later, Satan takes him high in the temple. He said, hey, Jesus, I want you to just throw yourself off. The Bible says that the, his angels will assist you and rescue you. And Jesus said, no, it is written that we are not to put the Lord our God to a foolish test. Every time Satan uh, uh, tempted him, he countered with Scripture. So Jesus was counterpunching 
with the Word of God on every situation. And so, let me ask, have you ever been tempted? Have you ever dealt with temptation to any level for anything? Maybe it's chocolate. Yeah, chocolate. Spiritual warfare. The devil is always, he's the tempter. That's what he does. And so the word of God is our truth that we stand on. It's our foundation. And it's to, to live according to the word of God. Now, let me just, before we get into our third point, when I talk about this, now listen, spiritual warfare. And why do we experience conflict whenever we pray or, or walk in faith or live according to the word of God? Is because those three things are more than just spiritual practices or, you know, uh, spiritual disciplines that we should pray. We should be men and women of faith and we should live and read the Word of God. But and now look at it from this perspective prayer, faith, and the Word of God are spiritual weapons. Okay? Now listen to this it's more than just a Christian practice or discipline, which it is. But think about it like this. It's a weapon. Now, let's go to the natural realm. Whenever you use a weapon, there's conflict. Isn't there? Whenever you use a weapon, I don't care if it's a club or if it's a gun or if it's a knife or whatever, if a weapon's being used, it's usually causing some conflict of some sort. Amen? These are weapons in the spirit realm. So when I begin to pray... Man, I'm fighting the devil. I'm pushing hell back. I'm working against the will of the devil and the things in the dark realm, the dark world. And when I'm, when I'm walking in faith and I'm demanding the enemy to lead and in faith I'm trusting God to give me victory over these battles and cancer and all these other things in my life, I'm using a weapon against the spirit realm. When I'm standing against the word of God, which is a spirit, a sword of the spirit, I'm using a weapon. Jesus is saying, no, it is... By the bread of the word of God, that man lives. It's like he took a swipe with a sword. He said, no, no, you're not to put the Lord your God to foolish test. He swung the sword. These are weapons, when you think about it like that, because we have this tendency to believe that, no, those are just spiritual practices or, or principles or disciplines that I do every day. And there's almost like there's this disconnect from the here and now and in the supernatural. Yeah, when I pray, it's just me and God. There's nothing else. You know, and I just trust God. It's almost like, again, the title of my message, Forgotten Darkness. We've all forgotten about an enemy that wars against our soul every single day. And he has demons, and, he, and they're in ranks. They're like an army. This was here. It was the, 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 the spirit of the prince of Persia. He was over that region. The devil's not stupid. Let's just understand that right now. He has an army, and there's ranks, there's levels, they're, they're strategically moving, just like you can imagine in, in, in uh, modern-day warfare. We're moving people, and we're doing stuff, and we're shifting, we're flying over here, we're sending troops here. The devil's doing the same thing every single day. But we just kind of go through. We've forgotten about darkness in the 21st century as we roll into the last days when we need to be more aware of it than ever before. Amen? Than ever before. Okay, let me give you the third truth. Before I get going too crazy. <laughs> we must respect our foe, but not fear him. Because we get people like this. I'll tell you, see TV evangelists do this, or even Christians, you know. Yeah, you know, I just slap the devil around. You know, he's a joke. You know, I, I just pounce on the devil. I don't take nothing from the devil. Yeah, that devil's nothing. I'm not afraid of no devil. You know, and, and we picture him just as some man in a little red pajamas with a tail <laughs> and a fork and horns. And he's totally harmless. No, he has strategies. He's over the kingdom of darkness. He's, he was a once an archangel. And when he was thrown out of heaven, he took a third of heaven with him. This guy's got power. Now, I don't have to be afraid of him. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And, and, and that I'm an overcomer in Christ Jesus. But listen, sometimes we just nonchalantly just go through, I ain't afraid of no devil. And, and, and he knocks us down because we just are so cash with it. How many here have ever seen the TV episode, The Twilight Zone? How many remember that? <laughs> You're old too. Now, in 1960, there was one episode uh, 
that was on, it's called the Howling Man. And so uh, here's this guy, he was traveling, he's just walking on foot through Europe, right? And so he's just traveling, well, a storm comes in, and so the scene in the movie uh, was, was cloudy, lightning, there was wind, the rain was pouring down, the trees were swaying, and you know, like they do in those old kind of scary movies. And so he, he stumbles across this like castle, like a monastery uh, where monks uh, lived. And so he knocks on the door and he's asking, hey, you know what? Gosh, can, you just, can I just stay overnight, just get through the storm? And they reluctantly let him in, and so they let him in. And uh, so they fed him, and he fellowshiped with the monks for a little bit. Well, uh, he kind of was walking around, checking the place out. And he hears this noise and this groaning going on. And so he goes down this hallway and, and, and he finds this guy who's locked in the cell. And there's a staff going across the door. And so he's talking to him, hey, what are you doing here? What happened? He says, well, I came in here kind of like you. You know, and, and they're all really nice and everything was great. And they locked me in here for no reason. And I, they're going to do the same thing to you. Let me out. And he's like, no, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm sure you're in here for a reason. He says, no, I'm, I'm telling you, I've done nothing wrong. And they had this conversation, and the guy was pleasant, friendly, caring. And so he goes back, this, this guy, this wanderer, and he goes up to the head monk, he says, hey, I came across this guy that's in the cell. With the staff across the bar, uh, the door, and you're holding him captive in there. What's the deal with that? And he says, that's probably what you're going to do to me. He said, no, 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 that man that you're talking about in that jail cell is none other than Satan himself. And the guy's like, what? Really? He was the nicest guy. And so he said, no, 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 don't let him fool you. So he kind of left. He goes back. And he says, hey, the head monk told me you're the devil. The guy just like, really, do I look like the devil? And he's like, oh, no. He goes, look, I'm telling you. I'm just like you. Matter of fact, you're going to be in here too. And the guy says, well, the monk said uh, that you're held captive by the staff of truth. And he said, yeah, whatever. If you can look that, move that for me, let me out. I would so appreciate it. And so he ends up letting him out, right? So in the movie, lets him out, and he starts walking down the hall, and turns back to the guy that freed him. And, and you know, like some little spell thing, that guy kind of froze and fell. And, uh, the, the, you know, the uh, special effects weren't so good back in 1960. But they tried. And then he, as he was walking, his face was turning, the horns started coming out, and it, it ends up being the devil. And then he turns around and a puff of smoke, and he's gone, right? So then the guy goes back to the head monk and says, Hey, gosh, I'm so, I let him out. He goes, You let the devil out? And he said, Yeah. And the guy says, You know, you're going to have to live with the fact that you have brought the devil upon all humanity. And the guy's like, but he's, he seems so pleasant and so harmless. And he said, you know what, that's for hundreds and hundreds of years, that has always been man's weakness and the devil's strength. That he comes like a wolf in sheep's clothing. And he's deceptive, he's the liar, the father of lies. He, he's a deceiver. And I think sometimes we think of him as this, he seems so nice. And we don't understand when we talk about the spirit realm, darkness, we underestimate who he is and that he tries to deceive us and mislead us. And, 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 and that's why we, I say respect him, but don't fear him. Michael the archangel, when he was having an argument with the devil over the body of Moses, he didn't come here and say, hey, I'm Michael the archangel, devil, get out of here. Like he was all that because he knew it was all God. All power comes from God. All, everything is God. Praise be to God. It's all God. Now, look at Jude, verse, book of Jude, verse 9. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. Because even Michael didn't go walking in there like he was the man, he's going to slap the devil around. Because he realized he's just like you and me, a messenger of the kingdom, that we're a, a tool that God uses, an instrument to bring change, that it's not us. And so we, we, we need to respect the enemy, but not fear him, because we can do great. Amen?
It's just like a football team that doesn't respect their opponent, just doesn't plan, strategize, or think. They just go out there and play and they get shellacked. They just get beat. Think about this. When the, when the U.S. ever attacked any country or engaged in war, there was months of strategizing before that. Intelligence gathered. We gotta find out their weakness, their strengths, their culture. What do they do? What do they like? What, so you know everything about them before you attack. That intelligence is vital. We do the same thing. Now in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, back to the verse that we said earlier, it says, we put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies and tricks of the devil. Now think about that. Again, strategies and tricks. The devil has tricks. The devil has strategies. He's working. It's important that you gather spiritual intelligence so that you know how to fight. Now on the back side of your outline, if you would just flip it over, I've given you some spiritual intelligence so you can kind of understand who he is. The first one is, uh, and I'm not just like going to teach on this, that's mainly just information for you to have. But the first one, Satan's name, reveals his tactics. He's Satan, the adversary. Devil, he's a slanderer. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Uh, the evil one, tempter. Have you ever been tempted? That's what he does. Uh, and then jump down to number two. Satan attacks God's church by bringing false philosophies, false religions, false ministers, false doctrine, false disciples, uh, false morals. The, and then the third, Satan attacks God's people by directing uh, governments. He gets in high places in the government in the here and now to change policies, to change things, to uh, create havoc. He filtrates in everything. A lot of the stuff that changes that we see going in our culture, the devil's behind a lot of that. The, and, and on down it goes, deceiving men, destroying life. This is what he does. To dump to the very bottom and always know this, Satan's power is limited. He is created. God is the creator. He, he, has, uh, he can be re resisted by the Christian, James 4, 7. God places limitations on him. Job, God's in control. He has to go to God. Hey, God, can I do this? I mean, Satan has to check in with God. Uh, we, don't, we don't think that way. But here's something I want you to think about. He has tricks. And, and strategies. In a church, back in the church in Corinthians, uh, there was an individual that did some things that uh, angered the church and Paul himself. And Paul uh, said, hey, you know, we need to forgive and let this go. And the church, we need to, let this, we need to forgive and move on. Uh, and, and so why? Why did Paul address the church and say, hey, we need to forgive this guy? Look what it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Why? So that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are very familiar with his evil, what? Schemes. Paul is saying, look, if we, here's the devil. Let me just give you a, a, a scenario that can play out in your life. The devil likes to bring someone in your life that just agitates you. Someone that will anger you or hurt you. He'll try to create scenarios to where you have an opportunity to harbor unforgiveness. The Bible says, forgive as I have forgiven you. If you don't forgive, I'm not forgiving you. So we see that's a spiritual warfare. That's a, that's a big problem. And so he wants you to harbor unforgiveness. So now you're harboring unforgiveness towards somebody. You uh, never want to see him again. I'm never going to forgive them after what they've done. The devil's got you right where he wants you because now he's got an open door to come in. And in that, he's going to see bitterness, resentment, hatred. And he has every right to do that. And so Paul... And this scripture is saying, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not aware of his schemes. We then let's forgive this brother so he, Satan doesn't use that to create division and strife within the church. So that's just a small example of how Satan is working at so many levels in the, in the, in the world around us each and every day. Get it? Awesome. Now, take your spiritual intelligence, know that, study that, and you have an idea of what you're battling each and every day. Fourth point, final point. Uh, Number four, we do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. In Christ's power, we are invincible. In Christ, you are invincible. The devil says, no, you're not. The devil says, you're always going to be that way. The devil says, you're never going to change. You are like, I'm, I'm over this addiction. The devil, no, you're not. Uh, things are getting better in my marriage. The devil says, no, it's not. 
I'm feeling better. No, you're not. No, you're not. Lies, lies, lies. He continues to try to tell you that. No, 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 no. God doesn't care. God's not there. God's not with you. And he continues to pound us on that. And a great example of that, when, when we invaded Iraq and we were going to war, there, the prime minister of information, the Iraqi prime minister of information, every time we went in and conquered, he was on TV. We invaded and took over the airport. The American troops tried to invade our airport, but we slaughtered every single one of them. We would go in and we would invade Saddam's palace. He's on there. The American troops tried to invade the palace today. We slaughtered them. Every day, even though the evidence was to the contrary, he was out there lying. Every day, he was on TV in the house, in their home, saying, we're winning. Everything's good. Nothing's happening. We're defeating the Americans. And every day, he's trying to see them. And eventually, though, it doesn't work. Until we get to that point where it's evident what the enemy is doing, and they realize, you know what, God is up. God does love me. God does hear my prayers. God does care about my situation. God is aware of my situations. God loves me, and therefore, out of His own love, I know He will take care of my situation. I know that God can take and fix this problem in my physical body, whether it be cancer or whatever, because he's the architect of the human body and I know he can fix it. I'm not going to listen to the lies of the enemy because my God is still Jehovah Rophe, the God who heals. And that who he is and understanding and quit listening to the lies of the enemy because that's what he'll do. Church, you are victorious. You are more than conquerors, the Bible says, in Christ Jesus. We don't fight the devil for victory. We we start from victory. We fight from victory because we are already victorious. Everything is in control because that's where I put my trust, my hope, and my faith in the sovereignty of God. And that is that God is in absolute control. Everything, 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 the good, the bad, the ugly is in the very hand of God. There is nothing the devil can do without God's permission. Everything is Father filtered. Everything goes through the filter of the Father, and everything that happens, God's aware of it, knows what's going to happen, and He has a plan for it. And so whether we slip and fall and allow the devil to lead us down a, a slippery slope and we end up in falling into the trap, God still can redeem us and bring us out of that if we trust Him every day. It's a learning. It's a learning process. And God says, you know what? I didn't want that to happen to you. But you know what? When it's all said and done, your faith is going to be greater. When it's all said and done, you and I, we're going to be tight. Our intimacy and our relationship is going to be better than ever. There's so many things happening in the spirit realm that we don't even get. You have no clue. And sometimes you just got to say, God, what are you doing? <laughs> because, Lord, I know you're in control of all this. The devil can't do anything. You don't let him do. <laughs> Look at what it says here in 1 John 4, 4. But you, church, get this. But you belong to God. My dear children, you have already won your fight with these false prophets because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the one who lives in the world. And 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says this, for every child of God, that you, defeats this evil world by trusting Christ and giving, to give the victory. What does it say? Look at this. This is an awesome truth. It says, but you belong to God, my uh, dear children. And again, that's you. You have already won the fight with these false prophets because the spirit who lives in you is greater than he who is in the world. Let's jump down to the next one. Now, for every child of God defeats this evil world by what? Trusting Christ. By what? Trusting Christ. It's not you. That's why we don't get all big and puffed up. I'm going to slap the devil today. Dude, that, 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 that devil's going to slap you around. No, he won't. Come on, huh? I'll beat up the devil. No, you won't. That's what the disciples thought. When they tried to cast a demon out, they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus I know. Paul I know. Who are you? And the demons attacked them. Stripped them of their clothes. Beat them. And that's what the devil does. And he laughs when we think we're all that. If we don't trust in Christ to give us the victory. 
Look, there, there, there's different levels. We had the, the disciples trying to cast the demons out of the boy. Nothing happened. Jesus shows up. I'm like, hey, Jesus, can you do something? Your disciples, they try. And Jesus, some things take much fasting and prayer. And, and, and of course, Jesus takes care of business. Jesus, we like all the hoover and holler. Jesus was in control. He just walked out, you know, all right, you guys out. Go in the pigs. He wasn't all scared, having to yell and scream. Jesus walked in authority, power. And, and that's what we do. In the power and authority of Christ Jesus. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? And believe that Christ, or Jesus, is the Son of God. Look, church, this morning I just wanted to give you an introduction to spiritual warfare because I think, <coughs> look, I titled it Forgotten Darkness because I really think the church today in the 21st century has forgotten about darkness in the spirit realm. We, we, we pray to God daily. We believe in heaven. It's just like this one line thing. That, but we, we need to realize that there's things interfering. There's things happening behind the scenes at almost every level. And we need to start being sensitive to that. Uh, to we're not like Elisha's servant who just was kind of only, only aware and let the circumstances dictate how he felt. He, he was fearful. Elisha, there's too many. He says, what are you talking about? There's more of us than them. And as long as God is with you, there's always more of you than them. That's right. You're always bigger than your problems. Trust Him. So the goal is that may we as believers never forget the darkness that is at war with us every single day. And may we put the full armor of God, which I think maybe the next message I do will be on the full armor of God, and we stand firm. We stand firm in the Spirit of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for Your Word. We thank You for Your truth. Truth that sets us free. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you continue by your spirit to minister. Continue by your spirit to, Lord, give revelation to your people and understanding, Lord. And may they realize that their mightiness comes from you. Their greatness comes from you. And, Lord, from you, we can do all things. From you, we are victorious. Thank you for that. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the victory. For we walk in Christ Jesus, so therefore we have victory. And so, Lord, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. And we thank you for that. We give you the praise for that. It's nothing we've done, nothing we deserve, nothing we've earned. It's a gift. You've given us that if we accept you as our personal Lord and Savior. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning, nobody looking around, if you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that's where it all starts with you. And, and, and if you know that Christ isn't your Savior, you're not walking with Christ, and you're not saved, then it's not a coincidence you're here. And God wants to change that. So if you're here with, I'm not going to you stand up or come forward, but if you're here and say, you know what, I need Christ in my life, just raise your hand. Real quick, I said, thank you, I see you in the back. Thank you, I see you to the left, thank you. Anybody else? I want to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior this morning. I want to leave this place knowing that I'm right with God. Praise the Lord. Church, let me lead you into prayer. Just repeat after me. Uh, and if you know you need Christ, but maybe you didn't raise your hand, you didn't know what was going to happen, you felt uncomfortable, but you know you need Christ in your life, say this prayer as well with a sincere heart and let God come in your life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your incredible love that you are willing to send your Son to die on the cross. Lord, thank you for Calvary, the greatest victory of all. And Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Become Lord of my life in every area of my life. And give me strength to live for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, church, let me just ask you, this morning, if you would say, you know what? I'm aware. I haven't forgot. I've been reminded of the dark forces that war against our soul. And I want to be like, a warrior for the kingdom. I, I truly want God to help me be more effective in fighting the cause of Christ.
If that's you, just slip your hand up. I'm just going to pray over you. Thank you, thank you, many of you. Thank you. Praise God. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that, Lord, that your hand be upon every person in here. Lord, I ask that you just continue to make yourself real to us each and every day. And that, Lord, that you would enable us to be sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our own lives that would protect us from the devil's schemes and strategies. Lord, help us to be mindful of the fact that every day and every moment the enemy is working against us. And that, Lord, that, that everything we say and everything we do would be to honor you, to advance your kingdom. So, Lord, give us wisdom, give us strength, give us discernment. Lord, we ask that you, Lord, give us your blessings. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.